Perfect. Hi. So in this, com this conference, we talk a lot about mental health and taking care of each other and also ourselves. So it turns out that entrepreneur and self-founded micro-entrepreneur community is a lot similar. Lots of stress, lots of you know, projects, building things. And there's this excellent podcast called Zen Founder Podcast that you might want to listen to because there's a clinical psychologist on it, an entrepreneur, they're a married couple, and they talk to each other about the stresses and challenges, how to raise kids in this environment, how to raise money, what it does to the relationships. Lots of talk about burnout, depression, and how to take care of yourself in such environments. They also talk about origin stories, which is interesting because that helps you to realize, oh, that's why I'm broke in that specific way. So check it out. The really nice 25 minutes episode. And one of the things they also recommend is taking something they call founder retreats, where every about six to 12 months, you take a weekend off for yourself and you reflect on how, how your life is going, what are your positive moments, what are your negative moments, through kind of questions like, when, I was, when was I the best version of myself, when I was the worst version of myself, and why, why have I failed, maybe, my challenges? And then you can rethink, kind of pause your life, and see, oh, if I stop doing the same thing over and over again, maybe it will get better. So check out their podcast episodes on this topic. They also have a really nice book on that. It's, it's a short one, but at least in my experience, it changed the way I um, timeline my life. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I used to have something up there. You'll have to go to my GitHub to check it out. Um, my name is Daniel Quinn. So if you go to GitHub and you go to Daniel Quinn, um, there's a project on there called Django constant demo. Um, but the idea is that there's this pattern I've seen when I'm trying to install a third-party app that I find really kind of counterproductive. Um, almost all the documentation in there says things like, what you need to do is go to your settings.py file and add these four, five, ten, sometimes even more um, arbitrary um, constants values that usually paths are sometimes more important things like passwords. Um, and this is the standard pattern that we follow, and settings.py is getting ridiculously big and hard to integrate with, um, it just becomes hard to manage. Um, so what I've ended up doing in some of my other projects um, is I create another file inside my app called constants.py. And in there, I use the 12-factor standard, which I would recommend that we all follow because it's fantabulous. Um, you follow the 12-factor standard, which basically says constants.py looks for the um, environment variable that says, I'm looking for this variable, and it populates there. And there, for the rest of your app, rather than importing from django.conf import settings, settings.thething, you just say from my local import dot constants this value. Um, you can also have your constants value pull things from settings.py, which is what someone in one of my other repos wants me to do. Um, that's up to you, but what makes it really nice is that you end up compartmentalizing and making your app more independent from Django. It also makes it handy if you want to use it outside of Django. It doesn't make your project dependent on using this Django settings thing that not everyone may have access to. So, if only I could get this to work, I, I thought it would be cool to not bring the keyboard and like try it out that way, but clearly that didn't help. Um, yeah, check out my GitHub, there's an example up there, and that's all I got. Thank you, Daniel. Hi everybody, first so, talk ever. Flavio Curella. Hi, this is my first talk ever, so please bear with me. <laughs> Which microphone is it? This one? Both. Stereo. All right. I'm going to talk about the WebSocket bridge, which is the JavaScript wrapper that's shipped with channels. Uh, you probably heard about channels on Monday. Uh, I haven't seen Andrew's talk, but I think he touched on that. So. Uh, the JavaScript uh, wrapper basically bridges the gap between channels on the server side and your JavaScript, your front end. And it's simply a convenience wrapper, some syntactic sugar around uh, reconnecting with software. It's designed to be framework ag agnostic and it uh, parses and load JSONs for you. Uh, basically, the message from the text 
uh, text from the message, you get an object back uh, the other way, and it supports the, the multiplexing out of the box. Multiplexing is this feature in channels where you can uh, encapsulate your messages in different name streams. <coughs> it's shipped with channel since version 111. Oh, okay. And this is how you can include in your templates. This is how you initialize and connect it to your web sockets. And this is how you, you listen to messages. You basically register a callback and you do whatever you want with the message that will be just an object. This is how you send a message from JavaScript to the web socket. And for multiplexing, this is how a multiplex message looks like. It's got a stream name and the payload. And to listen to a specific stream, you call the multiplex method with the stream name and register another callback. And this is how you send to a specific stream. Uh, you can see more example on the first uh, repo Andrew made. The package is also available on NPM and so that you can uh, extend it to a support for specific frameworks. I already built support for Redux, but it would be nice if anybody with the experience would write something for Ember or Ember 2, Mobex or whatever is the cool framework of the day. That's all. Thank you, Claudia. Okay, so I want to give you guys a quick demo of event-driven orchestration uh, with Django using SaltStack. So a lot of people think SaltStack is just a configuration management tool, but it actually does so much more. So we can actually, so all the things I'm going to show you are actually in this GitHub, and I'll show that link at the very end of the presentation as well. So, I can't see it. So I have a, a cluster of machines actually running here locally on my laptop. There are three app servers and there are three, a database server and a proxy server on the very front end of this. So pretty common setup, I think, for, uh, this paper? Pretty common setup, I think, for a lot of app Django type applications. So I'm gonna put this so you can see this, and then I'm gonna drag this down so you can see it at the same time. So I'm actually going to run uh, commands on the salt master, which is actually running right here. So first case to kind of prove this is all real and not fake. Uh, there is actually the salt minions all responding to my master calls. You can actually see the events happening up here in this top uh, section. So the event bus shows everything that's happening on the salt master in real time. Now if I wanted to release code, my local machine, even better. So I can actually use the API and talk to the master from my local dev machine with ACLs controlled by the sysadmins so I can allow developers to do production code releases without having to give them access to the master or any SSH access into the servers themselves. So in this case, I'm gonna run the orchestration production release. It will loop over each of the app servers in turn and you can see up here in the um, in the event bus, you can watch the events scroll by, and actually on the top panel, you should see it pull the app servers out of the load balancer, and then put them <coughs> back in as the code release happens. So this is actually pulling the master on each of the machines, uh, running collect static, uh, sleeping for like 10 seconds, and then putting the, the app server back into the uh, load balancer as, as it goes through each of them in turn. So you're getting a dependencies between the machines that it won't move on to the next machine if there's any failure or any of the previous steps along the way. And it also will take it out of the load balancer and not put it back into load balancer unless everything succeeds up to that point. So while that's actually working, I'll show you how that's actually uh, defined. So we actually use a, a YAML here and we uh, loop over each app server using Jinja templates and then it just goes through and runs the various states. You can see some of the states are actually supported natively in salt stack for Django, which is the uh, collect static right there, and then it, it handles all the interactions for us. So if you actually want to try this out, you can Vagrant up uh, by pulling that out and typing Vagrant up and you'll get the exact same setup on your uh, laptop. Thank you, Kelvin. <laughs> Next on stage. It's a monster. Oh yeah, phew, that was all right. It's cleverer than me. All right, hello. Uh, three minutes starting, yes. Even more planet-friendly web development with Django. 
<laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Chris Adams, as you know. Uh, I am Mr. Chris Adams, everywhere online, forever in the shadow of other developers called Chris Adams who work with Django. Uh, when I grow up, I want to be a guy called Brett Victor. He's the person I name checked before. He is basically an idea machine, and I really recommend finding out about this person because he's just, there are so many really interesting things he's doing. So there are all these videos about how we can use technology and use like programming to kind of act as a kind of amplifier for how we think. But also, he's also been talking about climate change too. So he's been making various kind of interesting snarky tweets like this, right? And uh, other ones like this, like uh, this one here in particular, don't panic, don't despair, build. Chris off an engineer, step up and start engineering. Really, really inspiring stuff, right? Uh, he's got this essay, and I really, really would recommend reading this essay. Because one of the things he does, he talks about all this entire, this huge subject, but he introduces this idea of a model-driven debate. So this is a little bit like how Hans Rosling said, you need to have a data-driven discussion about this stuff. And uh, he basically says, well, you need to have data in order to actually have any kind of public decisions about this. So if you're talking about, say, flying, or your diet, or meat, you need to have, the, you need to have information and numbers for this. So, oh bugger, you can't see all of it, can you? But Basically, you get, 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 get the general idea. And one of the key things he says is, well, what if, you, what if what we need to be able to do is basically pull this data very, very quickly into our conversation so you can kind of pull up a graph or get access to the numbers to model this kind of stuff. Like, what, what if you could NPM, in, NPM install something about a model? And like, this is, a, this is kind of what we were working on at one, one startup I was at, right? It was called Amy, Avoid Mass Extinction Engine. And, uh, it was behind, the general principle was this, by Mr. Peter Drucker and many other people. Like, what gets measured gets managed. So if you know your footprint, you can start re reducing it. And the business plan was a bit like this, all right? Like, raise money, hire scientists, read loads and loads of dense scientific papers, build models on these papers in JavaScript, and then put APIs on these models, then profit, right? And, uh, well, I, what I can say is that we didn't change the world. But what we did do is re release all, the, all, all this information. So it, there is now, oh good lord, there we are. We've actually got this, all the information that we, we, we spent all this money, like 10 million US dollars burning through to find. We've actually put it all on GitHub now. So if you want to find the science about, say, the, the impact of meat, you can find out all this stuff. If you want to find out the data, here's what you, ha here's what you have. If you want to run a calculation, it's been implemented in JavaScript. And like, you can run this anywhere, right? Now, I'm going to run out, I'm going to run out of time very, very quickly, so I'm just going to give you a heads up. I've set up a mailing list, planetfriendly.productscience.co.uk. If you want to find out more about this, go there and join the mailing list, and I'll be very, very, very considerate about your time. Thank you, Chris. Now, um, hi everyone, I'm Patrick, and I work at Sync Studio as a full stack developer, and today I'm going to talk about GraphQL, which is an alternative to REST. Oh, sorry which is an alternative to REST, but don't get me wrong, I do love REST, but sometimes you need something that's a little bit more developer friendly. Uh, imagine that like um, front, -end, front end people is gonna ask you for a new endpoints, uh, for a new page for example, and suddenly you end up with too many endpoints, which is not good. And also you want the API to be front end driven, which means that, uh, for example, you want the API to be as fast as possible, so it's gonna be like low latency and also it's gonna only send the, the, the data they the client actually need, so you end up using GraphQL. But what really is GraphQL? GraphQL is a declarative query language, which means that um, basically you can specify the data that you need, uh, also filtering them, and it's gonna return only what you ask for. Um, imagine that you have this data structure, so a user with a name, email, and some friends. Um, to make this um, a GraphQL query, you just remove the values and the uh, double quotes and commas, and you end up with this query, which basically is telling, oh, give me the user with their name, email, and their friend's name. Um, so this is your first query, which is really, really simple, and so I don't know what you need. Um, so GraphQL is amazing, but, uh, GraphQL is amazing, but I don't really have time to uh, dig into it. There is really more than that. Um, but yeah, if you want to try, I recommend uh, Graphene, which is our Python library, uh, which also works with Django. It's similar to REST framework, so basically you can build uh, uh, queries like this 
and they hook up to the Django models. Also, if you are a front-end person, I do recommend Apollo, which is a JavaScript library which do, does clever stuff like caching or merging fragments. But I want to show a quick demo. Give me a second. So uh, when you create a GraphQL API, you get um, a free client which is called, called Graphical. Basically, you can write query and get the result, and for, it's really good for development. So imagine that we have, I made a quick demo in between with the uh, conference, uh, which is basically uh, the Oscar winners. Imagine if you want to get the, the winners and the, and the categories. You just write this query, and you get the categories. But if you want to add, for example, the winner full name, you do this and you get the query with all the, you get the results with all the, the fields that you asked for. Um, you can also filter, for example, you can specify a category like this. But yeah, in this case, there is nothing. But let's say that we have. Uh, Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> Sorry, I have to finish this. I imagine that you have some. Uh, you have an award for the best of uh, conference organizer. Imagine what would be, who would be. Jacopo. Thank you. Okay. Um. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm embarrassed. <laughs> picture, <Good>. picture, picture. <laughs> yes, and Bartek Show is... Show the Oscar. Is, yes. <laughs> and thank you, thanks to all of you. I swear, this, this was not expected and not no. organized at all, so... No. <laughs>